time. Now, when you're um, when when you're measuring uh, people's health, and when you're measuring people's health in regard to how much sleep they have, like what? How do you how do you do that? Do you just talk to people? Do you do surveys? Like how do you get like a detailed analysis of people's patterns? So you can do it at many different levels. I mean, we can start at the sort of gross high level, which is epidemiological studies across millions of people, where you do surveys, you ask them about their sleep, and then you look at health outcomes. The first thing from that data that's clear is an, an unfortunate truth. The shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. Whoa. Short sleep predicts all-cause mortality. Which is really ironic because people that want to sleep less are like, you know, I don't have a whole lot of time. Yeah. You know, this life is short. Well, yeah. it's fucking shorter if you sleep less. Yeah, that, that old <laughs> maxim, you know, you can sleep when you're dead. Yeah. Well, it's mortally unwise advice because we know from the data you will be both dead sooner and the quality of that now shorter life will be significantly worse. Yeah, that's counterintuitive to people. The, the idea that you need this, it's not just like you're making best use of time by sleeping less. You're not. You, you'd make best use of time by being awake less. Exactly. Which is crazy. I mean, wakefulness, firstly, from a brain perspective, is low-level brain damage. We know that. Wakefulness is? Yeah. Low, like right now, we're, you and I are getting low-level brain damage. Yeah, that's right. And it's sleep that offers a reparatory function. Wow. And, and you know, I'll give you one example, which is your risk for Alzheimer's disease. Insufficient sleep across the lifespan now seems to be one of the most significant lifestyle factors determining whether or not you'll develop Alzheimer's. What studies, or if any, have been done on people that work the third shift? So people have looked at shift work in general. Um, they haven't necessarily split it down at to that granular point. But um, what we see is that shift workers have higher rates of obesity, higher rates of diabetes, but perhaps most frighteningly, cancer. And in fact, we now know the link between a lack of sleep and cancer um, is quite strong. Insufficient sleep is linked to cancer of the bowel, cancer of the prostate, cancer of the breast. And the association has become so powerful that recently the World Health Organization decided to classify any form of nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. Whoa. Yeah, so jobs that may induce cancer because of a disruption of your sleep-wake rhythms. Are there other correlating factors? Like, don't people that sleep less or work into the night, don't they eat more and eat more shitty food? They do, both of those things. Yeah. Yeah, and we know exactly the pathways. So there are two hormones that control your appetite and your weight. Um, one is called leptin, the other is called ghrelin. Um, they sound like hobbits, but they're not the real, <laughs> the real hormone, the real chemicals. They do sound um, like hobbits. Yeah, it's bizarre. But, um, so <laughs> leptin is the chemical that tells your brain um, you're full, you're satiated, you don't want to eat anymore. Ghrelin does the opposite. It's the hunger hormone. It says you want to eat more, you're not satisfied with your food. If I take people, and these studies have been done, we've done some of these studies too, and you just put you uh, a group of healthy people on four or five hours of sleep for, let's say, one week, and you look at those two hormones, they go in unfortunately opposite directions. So leptin that says you're full, stop eating, that gets suppressed by a lack of sleep. Ghrelin, the hunger hormone, that gets ramped up. So firstly, people who are sleeping just five to six hours a night will on average eat somewhere between 200 to 300 extra calories each day because of their underslept state. Add that up, it's about 70,000 extra calories a year. It's about 10 to 15 pounds of obese mass each year, which uh, for me is starting to sound familiar. Um, but what we also know is that it's not just that when you're underslept, you eat more you eat more of the wrong things. Mm. So if, and these, the, the great scientific work, if you give people this sort of finger buffet and they can eat whatever they want and it contains all of the different food groups and you sleep deprive them or you give them a full eight hours of sleep, yes, they start to overeat by somewhere around about 450 calories with total sleep deprivation. But what they go after is heavy hitting carbohydrates and simple sugars, processed food, and they stay away from the healthy sort of leafy greens, nuts, proteins, et cetera. Mm. So you're not just eating more, you're eating more of the wrong things. And that's why a lack of sleep has such a strong obesogenic profile to it. And you can take a step back too and you say, well, if you look at the rise of obesity over the past 70 years, it's just this 
upward exponential increase. And if you plot on the same graph the amount of sleep that society is getting, it goes in the opposite direction. As sleep time has declined, obesity rates have increased. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the obesity epidemic is simply a sleep problem. It's not. It's a problem of us being sedentary, processed foods, larger food serving sizes. If you take those factors though, by themselves they cannot explain the increase in obesity. Other things are at play. Is sleep one of them? Now we know it is. It's a critical factor in the obesogenic uh, epidemic. I know from personal experience when I'm tired, I always gravitate towards the worst choices. It's, for me, it's late night cheeseburgers. Yeah. You know, Wendy's at two o'clock in the morning or whatever.